Okay, so today we are going to do another special class on uh, this one is going to be on data centers and cloud computing. There is going to be a term paper that you need to do uh, produce as the last homework, which is also going to be related to this topic. Okay. So uh, I did mention last time for those of you who could make it that I would put up the term paper last week and then it would be due this week. But I figured since I hadn't actually uh, presented the background that's needed, I haven't put it up. I'm going to do that today. Okay, officially the pay tape paper uh, is due at the end of this week when classes end. But because you may all have other things due, I will accept uh, submissions next week as well. Okay? Technically, as per university rules, I cannot have assignments due during finals week. Yeah, that's what they say. So, so I'm going to keep the official deadline as this week, but there will be no late penalties if you submit sometime next week. Okay, that way I don't flout the rules, but you get to get some extra time to turn in your term paper. Okay, so I'll say something about the term paper at the end of the lecture once we have gone through the material. Alright, so let's get started. So there are uh, two or three topics that are interrelated that I'll cover. I'll talk about data centers first. Okay. Then I'll, go, I'll give a quick introduction to a technology called virtualization, which is very related to operating systems. It's going to be very high level. We don't really have the time to go into the details of what it is, but I'll give you an overview of what it means. And then with that, with those two topics, we can then talk about cloud computing because the uh, cloud platforms that are out there depend on both of those. Okay, so let's start with what are data centers. Okay, I don't know if any of you have heard this term, but uh, uh, what it means is basically it's a data center is a facility okay, where you can deploy lots of servers and storage. Okay, so it's out of a back-end facility. They are referred to as server and storage farms. They come in many different sizes. They are used by companies to deploy their servers which run their application. They are used by online services, the very large ones uh, use them to deploy again all of their applications. Universities use them for running research uh, as well as educational applications. Okay? So essentially it's a, a large facility, it has racks, the racks contain servers. So the data center provides uh, for electricity, cooling, okay, air conditioning, networking capabilities to the server. Okay, I'll show some pictures on the next slide. Okay. So some of the largest, so they will see that they come in many different sizes and some of the largest ones are run by uh, companies that are very large online services like Google and Amazon, eBay, Facebook. They run very large ones. You can have very small ones and we'll see what sizes mean as well. Okay. So here's a picture of what uh, a data center looks like. As you see, there are aisles. Okay? Think of it as a, as la, large or larger than a supermarket with aisles, except that the aisles don't have products, they are servers. Okay? And it's not meant for, uh, it's meant for running your application. So each of these blue things is a rack. Okay? And you see that there are these rack mount servers that are slotted in. And there may be st storage associated with the servers. And what your data center is simply doing is uh, providing space it provides cooling. Okay? The servers, if you have lots of them, generate a lot of heat when they run. Okay? So they have to be cooled, otherwise the, mayor, the facility will become so hot that the servers will start failing. Okay? So they provide air conditioning to the servers and they have backup power supplies. So if uh, the electricity fails for any reason, you will have either UPSs or diesel generators or things like that too, so that the servers continue to run especially for very critical applications that cannot afford downtimes. You will have these backup sources of power. They have good networking capabilities. There are good connectivity to the internet and so on. Okay. So essentially, it's a warehouse with filled with uh, racks of server storage. Okay. That provides cooling, infrastructure, power, backup generators, networking, and so on to applications. Okay. Now, as you can imagine, this is related to our discussion of client server application. We saw some very simple, rather trivial client server applications. So, the more complex server applications are typically deployed on data centers right, by the companies that run them. 
Okay. Here are some pictures of a data center that was built by UMass in collaboration with a few different universities. It's a university <coughs> data center. It's uh, based in Horio, about 10, 15 miles down from here. Uh, so the picture there shows what this facility looks like from the outside. Okay. Now the reason it was deployed in Holyoke is uh, data centers consume a lot of electricity to power their servers. Okay. This facility can uh, take several thousand servers. Okay. Now if each server takes 500 watts of per kilowatt of electricity and you have several thousand of them okay, and then you need large uh, air conditioners or chillers to cool them you can then do the math and you'll see that most data centers, even this is a somewhat small data center okay, and it takes 10 megawatts of power. Okay, that's a fair bit of power if you think about 10 megawatts okay, so it can supply electricity to several hundred or more homes. Okay. Large data centers take even more, okay. the largest ones take enough electricity that will power a small city. Okay. So as you can imagine, electricity is an important issue when you build a data center. If your price of electricity, if you build it in a place where the price of electricity is high, you are going to get monthly bills for the power you consume. Okay. The largest data centers generate electricity bills of millions of dollars a month. So if you can even get a 10% cheaper electricity somewhere, you are going to save a lot of money over the peak lifetime of that data center. So most companies that have very large data centers tend to deploy them in places where electrification is you need space to be cheap as well okay, because they are giant warehouses. Okay, so many of them are several tens of soccer fields in size okay, or football fields in size. So, so you need cheap space okay, to build these warehouses and you need cheap electricity. Now the reason I'm mentioning all of this is Holyoke is the one of the places in Massachusetts where electricity is very cheap because they have abandoned hydropower you know, on, the, on the dam on the Holyoke Connecticut River. They have hydro facilities so it generates cheap power. So you get cheap electricity which is why these universities including UMass decided to put one up there. Okay. Something to keep in mind okay, when uh, we don't really tend to think of uh, designing systems based on the price of real estate or the price of electricity but when you build data centers it does matter. Okay. Now uh, this other picture, so that picture shows the, the electricity uh, equipment in the data center. It's basically uh, there are aisles of these power uh, racks of power, uh, power supplies. Okay. They supply electricity to the data center. There are backup diesel generators which are not shown there. There are also uninterrupted power supplies. If the power goes, then you switch to the UPS. The UPS has some limited capacity. In that time, you spin up a diesel generator so you don't lose power to the servers. This is basically a pipe that delivers cool air to the servers. The pipe is about 8 feet in diameter. So that's the amount of air you are pumping into the machine room. Okay, which is where the servers are. Okay, these are also uh, pipes that deliver cool air to the, uh, to the rooms in that sold servers. This is essentially an aisle of racks. Okay, so uh, at the moment this facility opened about a year ago, okay, last November is when it opened. It's only one year old. It is about a third full at this point. Okay, so many racks are still empty. As <coughs> universities buy more servers, that is where they are putting them. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, this facility is called MGHPCC, Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center. Okay, the, uh, the reason it's green is it is actually built to be very energy efficient. Okay, so for instance, it doesn't typically for most of the year, it doesn't actually use air conditioners or chillers to cool the facility. It uses outside air. Okay, so uh, if, if you live in cool climates, the temperature inside your data center is actually going to be higher than the temperature outside. So you can just use outside air and then use that to cool the facility. Only in very warm days of summer when you cannot use outside air or when it, air is very humid and not in a position and you cannot use very humid air.
to cool data, uh, to cool servers, the humidity causes trouble. That's when you use backup chillers. It does have chillers, but most of the time they are not used. They're just there for backup purposes. So as a result, the operating cost of this data center is much lower than typical data centers that run on air conditioners. So the general rule of thumb is if you spend a dollar of, of electricity to power a server, you spend another dollar of electricity to power the air conditioner to cool the heat generated by servers. So essentially, the electricity cost doubles uh, because the air conditioners also consume a lot of, of chillers rather consume a lot of electricity. So if you can do away with uh, using these air conditioners for much of the year, you have reduced the operating cost quite a bit. It saves on electricity bills. So it's basically uh, green from that perspective. It uses hydropower okay, because it's based in Holyoke, so it's, that's a clean source of electricity as well. So that's one way to build a data center, but that's an expensive way to build data centers. This facility costs $80 million to build. Okay, that's not even the cost of the computers that go in. There. That's just the shell, the air conditioner, the power uh, infrastructure, the networking and so on. Okay, the computers are separate uh, from that cost. So it's an expensive proposition to build a data center. So here is basically what uh, companies like Microsoft and even Google have started doing. They have started building data centers in modular units. Yeah, so, so this is not a warehouse anymore. You'll see that it's basically exposed to the elements. Okay, and the computers essentially sit in these containers. They look like uh, this uh, 18 wheelers. Right? So they have this shipping containers. So essentially, rather than that, this is what it looks like here. Uh, rather than actually building a warehouse and putting computers inside, you get a 40-foot container and you put computers in the container and you just cool the container and power the container. <coughs> Much cheaper way of building it because each unit is self-contained. Okay, essentially, the idea is rather than ordering servers from uh, manufacturers and then having the servers be actually installed on racks and somebody cabling it, you just order a container of servers. Okay? And then the manufacturer of these servers, whoever that may be, uh, HP, IBM, Dell, any server manufacturer, assembles the entire container for you. They actually populate it with the servers, they do all the cabling, they ship the entire container to you. So when the container comes in, all you need to do essentially is to power it. Okay? You supply power, you supply networking and you supply cooling okay, and then everything is already installed uh, by the vendor. So it's much easier to deploy. Okay, so now you are building it in modular units of sort of one container at a time. You see a crane there which is uh, essentially deploying a new container that you have ordered. Okay, so you can grow your data center over time as your needs grow. Okay. And because the cost of building this is very high, uh, this is a new technique that has been used by many companies to build their data center. You build them one container at a time. Each container can have a few thousand servers, well, not a few thousand, that's too many. A few hundred servers with maybe a few thousand cores. Okay, think of a 40 foot container with maybe two racks and then that's all that's in there and it's engineered to be cooled and networked. Okay. Modern data centers. Well, use Lego like blocks to build it. That's basically the, okay. So that's the, the background on data centers. And when we come back to cloud computing, we'll talk about data centers again. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, virtualization technologies that are used on the server. Yes, thus far, I only talked about the physical infrastructure in data centers. Now let's talk a little bit about how these servers are actually uh, uh, used. So most of the servers actually run um, applications, whatever the application may be. They may be web applications, databases, streaming servers. It depends on what the company that has deployed the data center is using them for. But what is increasingly the case is that most of the servers are uh, using this technology called virtualization. I don't know if any of you have used things like VMware or VirtualBox or any of these things. These are all virtualization products. And I'll say a little bit about what virtualization is and what it is used for in the server world. Okay. 
this is a definition of virtualization. I took this slide from my graduate course, okay, but I'm going to explain <coughs> what this means. Okay, essentially, what virtualization means is it's a way to emulate one interface using another. <coughs> it's a very simple definition. You use one interface to emulate a second interface. Okay? And depending on what interface you are emulating and what interface you expose, we have different kinds of virtualization and I'm going to explain that in just a little bit. Okay? But let me give you an example of where virtualization uh, is used or how it came about. Okay? So this technology is actually very old, although it's become very popular now. It dates back to the 1970s. It was designed originally by IBM, which used to sell very large, expensive mainframes to its customers. Okay. So in those days, what would happen is every time you came up with a new generation of your mainframe product, okay, it would have new hardware, it would have new uh, CPUs, okay. and in many cases, you, this new hardware was not compatible with the older generation of the mainframe. Okay. They would introduce some new techniques uh, in the hardware or new instruction in the hardware. So the compatibility was broken. Okay. The new hardware was better, okay. but any applications that were written for the old generation would not run on the new generation of hardware. Okay. Now, if you are a customer and are make, thinking of buying, let's say, a million dollar mainframe, that's what the cost used to be in those days, that's still the cost now. Okay, so if you're spending a million dollars on buying an expensive piece of <coughs> hardware and then the company that's selling you that hardware says this is the best you can buy okay, and uh, it's going to cost you a lot of money but by the way everything that ran on your previous version is not going to run anymore. Okay, so you have to redesign all of your applications or port them from scratch. Okay. But that's not what you want to hear uh, if you're invested a lot of money building custom applications. So let's say it's a bank. A bank has built applications to manage its customers' bank accounts and maybe provide services <coughs> to customers. They have ATMs and so on. And now if you say you buy this new hardware and then none of your old applications work, you have to redesign it, that doesn't quite work. What you want is to upgrade the hardware but all the applications should still run. Okay. Now clearly if you introduce new instruction sets and so on, that doesn't work. Okay. So what IBM came up with was this idea saying, let us make sure that the old applications run intact on the new hardware. Okay? And the way you did this was to use virtualization. Okay? And here is an uh, example. So let's say assume that this is the old machine. Okay? It uses hardware and software system A. Okay? A could be some old generation of a CPU. It could be an old operating system which uh, now has been replaced with newer operating system and you have apps. So it has, it has interface A which is the API that your OS exports and the instructions that your CPUs run and so on. And you have a program that let's say your customer has written for this main trip. Okay. Now if you buy a new hardware B okay, and you want to run the old application on this B, the way you do this is you write a virtualization layer that's going to use the new interface of B okay, and it's going to essentially mimic the old hardware. So the, ex the virtualization layer exports an interface that makes the application look, uh, uh, sort of gives an illusion that looks like the old hardware A. Okay. So what you've essentially done is you've used interface B okay, to mimic old interface A and thereby you can essentially run all of your old applications unmodified. So all these old applications, it looks like they're still running on the machine of type A, although they're actually running on a machine of type B. Is that clear what I said? So this was designed originally as a way to not spend any effort trying to port applications to newer generations of hardware because technology was evolving very quickly. Okay, keeping everything backward compatible was difficult when you are coming up with new kinds of uh, hardware all the time. Okay? So they said let's just build a software layer that allows you to run your old applications. Yeah, and then you can always write new applications and you can write them to the newer interface but the old ones still run intact. So now you can continue to sell expensive upgrades or hardware to your customers and tell them and you, by the way nothing has to change you just move all of your code and the data to the new machine everything <coughs> will run as is just run it on top of this virtualization software. Okay. So that's basically where 
virtualization came about. You know, that's back in the 70s and for a long time, that's all that it was used for. Okay. In the 90s, there were basically we saw some new uses for this technology. Okay. So now virtualization is used in a variety of different scenarios. Okay. It's used on desktop so that you can run one operating system on another. Okay. And I'll show some examples of that. It's run in servers where you can run multiple virtual machines on the same physical hardware. Okay. Different use cases, I'm going to uh, explain what they actually mean in just a moment. I'm going to talk a little bit about different types of virtualization first and give several examples. Okay. So I said virtualization is the ability to mimic one interface using another and there are different layers at which this can be done. Okay. If you have one hardware emulating another hardware, you've got what's called hardware level virtualization. Okay. Literally you are emulating one CPU instructions of one architecture using <coughs> another. Okay. Any of you have actually used uh, PowerPC Max, okay, which were prevalent about five, seven, six years ago before Apple made the switch to Intel. Okay. In those days, you could buy a product called Virtual PC. Okay. PowerPC clearly is not the same as Intel architecture, but you had the ability, if you use Virtual PC, you had a software emulation of an Intel PC that ran on your power PC. So you could run Windows on your power PC Mac. Okay? And Windows would just run on this emulated PC. All aspects of the hardware were emulated in software. That's a hardware level virtualization. You can do OS level virtualization where you are emulating one OS interface using another. Okay? So you have one operating system you essentially return the API of another operating system <coughs> using a virtualization layer. If you use this product called, uh, open source product called Wine, okay, that's a Windows emulator that runs on Linux. Okay, you can run Windows applications on a Linux machine because the Win32 API has been rewritten and ported to Linux. Okay, you're not running Windows, you just, you basically have APIs that have been written as libraries that run on top, okay? OS level virtualization. There are many other products or operating systems that do OS level virtualization. It's another place where backward, if backward compatibility is important, you can have one kernel, but it emulates an older generation of that same kernel. Okay, so that, that way if your new system calls or the system calls in the new OS are incompatible, you can tell the OS saying, for this application, pretend that you are an older version of this OS. Okay. So then you are emulating the old API using the new API. Okay. Another example of OS level virtualization. Okay. Application level virtualization, you have already seen. Java virtual machine is an example of an application level virtualization. It's a virtualization at the application level. Okay. The interface that the JVM is emulating is the Java virtual machine. It's an abstract machine, it's not a real machine. The JVM is what is being emulated using the underlying libraries that you use to write your JVM. Okay. So many different forms of virtualization going from <coughs> hardware level, OS level to application level. Okay. Any questions on this before I go into examples? Okay. So there are two types of virtualization. One is very prevalent in the desktop world. Another one is prevalent in the server world. I'm going to explain and then we'll look at some example. Okay. So they are given somewhat poor name. They're called type one and type two virtualization. But the basic idea is as follows. Okay, this is what you may have seen if you ever used any virtualization product on your desktop. Okay, so you have your host operating system. That's the OS that runs on your laptop or desktop you run some sort of a virtualization product. It could be VMware, it could be Zen, KVM, there are a whole slew of them. Okay. What that product does is that it emulates a different hardware. It essentially emulates a PC. Okay. Now what you can do inside that emulated software PC is run a second operating system. Okay. This operating system does not have to be the same as the previous one. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. It's any OS that will run on a PC. And then you can run applications inside that OS. So now if you have the ability to have an emulated PC on your computer, you can essentially run a different OS, a different application. 
you can use this for many different scenarios it's used widely used in product development if you are de developing a new product you run it inside a virtual machine to test it and that way if something breaks nothing has changed on your original file system you are running it in an emulated <coughs> pc okay. you can also use this to do cross platform development okay. you may have a mac if you want to develop for linux okay you run linux inside that guest os and then you can basically you have an entire pc that allows you to do what i just said yeah this is type 2 hypervisor yeah, this is used for desktop pc here is what is type 1 hypervisor this is actually used on most servers okay. here there is no underlying os okay. the the virtualization software runs directly on the machine okay. it runs on what's called bare metal okay. basically what you boot up is not an os you boot up what's called an hypervisor hypervisor is a term for a, a virtualization layer you essentially boot up a hypervisor okay, and that's basically the virtualization software and the interesting thing is on a sir even on a desktop you can create or you have the ability to run multiple virtual machines okay. each virtual machine is emulating the underlying server it's a software emulation of the server but you can emulate multiple of these okay. so here we have an example where you have a large server let's say you have an eight core server the most applications that you may want to run on that server do not need eight cores. Maybe they need one core or two cores. So what you can do is you can partition your server into smaller virtual machines and give each virtual machine maybe one or two cores. Okay. And inside that virtual machine you run an OS and on that OS you are going to run application. So now you have the ability to run eight servers okay, each having two cores on a 16 core server, physical server. This is how many data centers actually work. What you do is you buy heavy, uh, high-end, heavy-duty servers. They have lots of cores, but many applications may not need them. Okay? So rather than uh, wasting those resources, you carve up your server into smaller virtual servers. Each virtual server is a software emulation using virtualization. It looks exactly the same as a physical server, but smaller okay? because you gave it some fraction of the RAM, you gave it some fraction of the disk space, some fraction of the cores. Right? And then you run some OS on that virtual server and then inside the OS, so this looks like a regular machine. It has its own IP address, it has its own network name, etc. You can uh, run them concurrently, each of them is running in parallel because they run on different cores. Now you have the ability to run multiple servers on Okay. So I'm going to show an example of type 2 hypervisor okay, with using VMware for those of you who haven't seen anything like this before. Okay, so this is a product called VMware that allows you to virtualize a PC. Okay. So it's a software emulation of a PC. Okay. It's clearly running on my Mac. So it's there is the underlying OS, the host operating system is Mac OS X. Okay, so you construct a virtual PC. Inside that virtual PC, you can load whatever OS you want. So I actually have two of them here. One is Ubuntu desktop and Ubuntu server. So I have two virtual machines and let me start one. Yes, I'm going to just start this one. And it's actually, you can boot it up from scratch, but I have it suspended. So it's just starting from where I left it off. Okay. So this is now, uh, the virtual machine has started up. So this is Linux running inside a virtual machine that's running on my Mac. Okay. So you can do whatever you do on any Linux machine, which is start browsers, do whatever you want start. So it's basically a full-fledged uh, software emulation of a PC. You can have multiple of these running at the same time. You can have as many virtual machines running concurrently as you want. Okay. So you will see that there's one OS running on top of another OS. So this is Linux kernel that's running inside the virtual PC okay, and that's running on Mac OS X. Okay. Now to Mac OS X, it actually sees this whole thing as a single process. Okay. So it doesn't actually know about the present of a second operating system. It doesn't know about the presence of processes inside that operating system. This entire virtual PC looks like a process that's running. 
what's running inside the process is transparent to the underlying world. So that's being emulated by virtual P, the virtualization software and then the OS is running inside the virtualization software. And likewise, Linux here, okay, the kernel that's running here, thinks it's running on real hardware. Okay. It's oblivious to the fact that it's running on a software emulation of a PC. It's not running on real machine. It's running on a virtual machine. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff virtualization can allow you to do. Okay. You can essentially have multiple of these. You can pause them. So now you can do Linux development on your Mac because you can run a full-fledged Linux machine on your PC. Okay. This can happen on Windows. It can happen on any any platform that supports virtualization. Okay. Same is true. So that's basically, so this host here was Mac. The type 2 hypervisor was VMware Fusion. That's the product that I use. And the guest OS I showed you was Linux. And you had applications running inside that. Okay. So that's <coughs> one example. Same thing is true <coughs> in the server world. Okay. Except that you don't have this host. Okay. You directly boot the <coughs> virtualization software. Okay. It has its own OS-like uh, functionality and then you just start uh, virtual machines and start applications inside those virtual machines. Any questions here? How many of you have actually used something like VMware or VirtualBox? Yes, fair bit. That's good. So now you actually know what's happening under the hood. So here is a little more detail on virtualization of servers and it seems like Okay, so here we have uh, this scenario is referred to as server consolidation and uh, the way virtualization is used in data centers is as follows. So let's say you have some old servers, they're running some old operating systems, they have their own applications running on top. Now let's say your server hardware is getting old, every four or five years you replace your servers with newer servers. Okay. So you can say this five year old server. Yeah, I'm going to replace it with a new one, okay. except that the newer servers are a lot more capable than the old servers. Okay. This five years ago, you may have had a maybe one core or a dual processor machine. Today, you can buy servers with eight or 16 cores. Okay. Multi-core servers are common. So if you just do one-to-one -one replacement, okay, you're going to replace an old server with a lot more capable newer server. And this OS and the application that's running on that OS will only use a small fraction of the resources that the server is capable of. Okay. So it's very wasteful to take a five-year-old server and put a lot more powerful server and just run this one OS and this one application on this server. Okay. You are going to basically waste 90% of the resources because in five years the technology has improved significantly. So each server can do a lot more than what an old server could do. So then you should ask if I'm spending the money, okay, rather than doing one-to-one -one replacement, I'm going to do many-to-one replacement. I'm going to take many old servers okay, and replace them with a single server. Okay. And somehow I'm going to take all of these OSs and applications and run them unmodified on this new server. And this will do with virtualization. So this allows you to save quite a bit of money as you can imagine. Okay. Every four, eight servers is getting replaced by one physical server. So you saved money because you don't have to spend buy eight new servers, you just buy one. Okay, and you basically run a type one hypervisor on for each old server, you create now a virtual server. Okay, you create a virtual machine and then you just take this OS and this application and just run it inside the virtual machine. And it runs unmodified because you're emulating the old server using that virtualization technology. So that's basically what's referred to as Consolidation. So what's shown here is you took the old server, you created two virtual machines, VM1 and VM2. On VM1 you run, run Windows and the applications that were running on that. VM2 you basically take all of your data from Linux and your applications and run it. So nothing changes in terms of, you don't have to do any porting other than moving the data. You have to do what's called migration. But everything runs as is, you will have fewer servers. Uh, to manage fewer physical servers. Same number of virtual servers, but fewer physical machines. Yes. So, do, so like does each virtual machine like say, so say there's like eight, eight cores in there, so like each, each virtual machine, do they each say like get like 
for their own cores or do they share them sort of? Okay, that's a good question is how you are going to allocate uh, resources. That's what the next point was going to be. Actually, let me show. So what happens now is when you create virtual machines, you have the ability to tell the virtualization layer how to allocate resources from the physical servers to that virtual servers. Okay. There are many ways to do this allocation. You can do what is called physical partitioning or slicing where you dedicate resources. You say, let's say there are eight cores here. You say four cores go to virtual machine one. The other four cores go to virtual machine two. This is static partitioning. You just slice the server into two pieces and given half the resources to VM1, the other half to VM2. And in this case, there is no sharing of resources between virtual machines. That's one way you configure your virtualization layer. Another way is to do what is what was being referred to here as sharing. You say that here is a pool of uh, cores. Here is some memory. Okay? Allocate it based on the needs of the virtual machines. Okay? If VM1 has more compute intensive application, needs more CPU, dynamically allocate more CPU to VM1. And if VM2 needs more CPU at some later time, dynamically allocate those resources to CPU2. This is exactly what happens when you have multiple applications running on your kernel. You don't uh, statically allocate CPU time to application. You have a CPU scheduler, which uh, so, uh, studied a whole bunch of them. The CPU scheduler decides how much CPU time each process should get. Okay. Similar kinds of schedulers are present in the virtualization layer, except that they also allow you to statically allocate resources and say so this is what VM1 gets and that's all it gets. Okay, it cannot get any more okay, and it can waste whatever it's been given if it doesn't use it. Okay, that's one way. The other way is to just share all of the resources and have the scheduler allocate resources and memory and uh, other uh, and disk space to those virtual machines on the plane. So you can configure them either way. The virtualization layer is not going to confine you. It is flexible. It depends on how you want to configure in most cases, administrators like to have predictability, so they physically allocate cores and map them to virtual machines. Okay. But there are scenarios where you don't want to do that. You can allow sharing to take place as well. Okay, any other questions here? So the other nice thing about this is even if you statically allocate resources, okay, you can change the resource allocation on the fly. This is something you could never do on a physical server. Okay, so for instance, let's say Windows here needs more RAM. Okay, you allocated it 2 gigabytes of RAM. Now suddenly it needs more. What you can do is instruct the virtualization layer saying if there is unallocated memory on this machine, go dynamically allocate it to this uh, virtual machine. Okay? Or it may need more CPU. Yeah, maybe you had eight cores and you allocated three each to those virtual machines, two were spare, maybe for a third virtual machine or you just kept it un uh, unallocated. You can dynamically dynamically go and take a new core and assign it to virtual machine. Okay. This you cannot do on physical hardware. You literally have to open the box and plug in new cores onto your machine if you have uh, open socket. But here you can actually allocate cores uh, memory disk space to virtual machines on the fly. So that was the animation that was being shown there. It says VM1 needs more resources, so you allocate it more. Okay. You can also do something called migration, which is being shown here. So if you are, if you need more than what the machine, uh, the physical machine can hold, you can actually move these VMs from one server to another. Okay. This is referred to as virtual machine migration. Okay. So what happened here was. VM2 moved from server 1 to server 2. Okay. And this can be done without any downtime. You don't even shut down the virtual machine. And the OS continues to run, applications continue to run. You tell the virtualization layer to take that virtual machine okay, and move it to this other machine. So it basically has this technique called live migration where the application and the OS actually move. Okay. They jump from physically jump from one server to another without even shutting down the OS. Okay, so no downtime. So you have these advanced techniques that you can use to manage resources. 
Okay, now if you had a physical server without virtualization and you wanted to move an application from one server to another server, you would have to have a downtime. You would say maintenance time, you shut everything down, you copy all of the data and then you bring it up. Okay, that may take several hours to up to a day or more. A year you don't need to do any of that. You can use the virtualization technology to help you move. So these are some examples of uh, virtualization products that are uh, available. Some are open source, available freely. The top row is all open, free software. Zen and KVM are virtualization technologies built into Linux. Yes, yeah, so they are part of the Linux kernel. They help you create virtual machines inside Linux. VirtualBox is a desktop virtualization. Yeah, you can, it's like VMware. And Parallels is another company that builds similar software. <coughs> VirtualBox is free. The parallels and VMware are commercial products that you can buy and essentially do uh, virtualization of different flavors. Okay. So many different uh, products that do this now. Uh, many run on operating systems if they're type 2 and they use the OS as interface. Some of them have their own inbuilt kernel. The type 1, you essentially boot up your virtualization software. There's no kernel to boot. Okay, so here are some Examples I mentioned, uh, virtual servers already consolidation deployment, I gave that example. Here is another scenario of uh, using virtualization for desktop computers. Okay. And by this what I mean is not that you run a virtual machine product on your laptop. Okay, This is also referred to as a thin client environment where rather than giving employees a full fledged machine, Okay. You run a virtual machine on some server in the back end. You run a desktop operating system on that virtual machine. Okay. So the virtual, the PC is actually not running on the server on your laptop. It's actually running on some server somewhere. And you give the clients, or not clients, you give the employees what is referred to as a thin client, a lightweight client. And all they do is rather than running, keeping all of their data here, everything is there. They just use what is called as a remote desktop protocol to connect to their PC. Now they can connect to their PC so long as there's network connectivity because it's all happening over the network. So you can even have a tablet which runs a remote desktop protocol. It can, uh, connects to a full-fledged Windows PC. Okay, you can control and do whatever work you want to do on that PC from your tablet. All of your data is now stored on a server. It's not stored on your client anymore. Okay. So this is referred to as desktop virtualization. Now you may ask why would you ever do anything like this? Why not just give your employees a PC or a laptop and have them run all of their applications locally or natively on their machine? Easier to upgrade. You don't trust them with the more expensive hardware? You don't trust them with more ex uh, ex uh, uh, more expensive hardware. Both of those are true. There are also environments where you don't you want more flexibility. Let's say these PCs are not real PCs, but they are embedded PCs. So you go to a supermarket. Right? So the checkout counter is essentially a full-fledged PC. You actually look at it; it's a Windows PC running there. Okay, now, if you think of the IT department of this uh, supermarket, there are maybe hundreds of these stores. Each store has 20 PCs. Now, anytime, let's say, a security patch comes along, okay, they have to literally go to each of these stores and upgrade or in this, install this patch on this PC. Okay, it's a lot of effort for them to go from store to store and do all of this. And the, the checkout person, the cashier, doesn't actually need to use that PC. All they are running is one application, which is a checkout application. They are not using any <laughs> other functionality of that PC because it's only used for one purpose, which is to do checkups. So that's a good example where rather than having a full-fledged PC running on your uh, checkout uh, counter, you put a lightweight terminal okay, and then you run all of the software on some remote server. Okay. And then all that the checkout counter is done is you connect there and then you are basically running the application remotely over some sort of a display protocol. Okay, So it looks the same from uh, the... Uh, from the perspective of the checkout counter, except that now you made one important change 
which is all of the data, everything is running inside a virtual machine on some server. Now upgrading it is straightforward because the IT administrators are likely to be where the data center is. Everything is centralized. Okay? So you can go and upgrade them as you wish. You don't actually physically have to go to a store to do anything. Okay? That's one example. Okay? Uh, and there are many such examples. If you go to a bank, the bank teller has a PC where they're using that they're using to conduct transactions. Okay? They are not using the PC as a general purpose PC where they're browsing the internet or doing all sorts of things. This is a dedicated PC that's only running one application, which is a banking application. Okay, so these are all examples where uh, desktop virtualization is actually becoming popular. Okay? Rather than having to go and maintain PCs out in the field, everything has been centralized using virtualization. Okay, of course, you may not trust them uh, to operate PCs because you don't want the reason you don't let them browse the internet is if they actually go and download some malware uh, that's entered your banking system. Okay? So you don't want them to run anything other than this one application. Okay? So, so there are all good reasons why desktop virtualization is actually becoming popular. Okay? There are companies that offer free Windows desktops. Okay? You can go to uh, this company called OnLive as an example. They offer you a free Windows machine where you can run office applications. Yeah, so this is they offer an app, uh, app for the iPad. So you can use an iPad to connect to your free PC and do Microsoft Office uh, remotely. Yeah, just as an example of what kinds of scenarios people are thinking about. Yeah, so that's virtualization in data centers. And there are many challenges. So virtualization is a very flexible technology, but it's not without administrative challenges. And now there are a whole slew of new things that you have to think about, both from a system design standpoint as well as a IT standpoint. So how do you decide how much resources to give to a virtual machine? Okay, so I mentioned this example of consolidation where you take, let's say, four old servers and put them on one bigger server. Okay. Now, conceptually, that sounds straightforward. But now if you ask someone saying, how much CPU should you give to each of those virtual machines? It should be at least as much as what it had previously. Okay, but who decides how much that is? Because the old CPU was, let's say, a 1.5 gigahertz, five-year-old CPU. And now you have a new Intel 8-core machine, three gigahertz. Okay, what's the right way to figure out what is the amount of CPU that's equivalent in terms of number of cores or fractions of cores that's equivalent to the old machine? Okay. So there are many complicated things like that. Okay. When you put these virtual machines, you don't want them to interfere with one another. If they all do a lot of I.O., the disk is still shared. Okay. So they may actually see poor I.O. performance. So you want to think carefully about which VMs to put on the, serv the same servers and so on. Okay. So resource management is a big challenge in this environment. Okay. I also mentioned energy efficiency already. In data centers, energy is a big problem as well okay, because servers consume power, servers generate heat, and you need additional powers in using chillers to cool these servers. Okay, constructing energy efficient data centers is actually a very important and practical challenge. Okay, literally, it saves companies millions of dollars if you can reduce your electricity bills because that's the kind of uh, electricity bills they end up paying or very large data centers. Okay. So that's basically a cost consideration. So designing data centers, servers to be more efficient is also an important research as well as a production challenge. Okay. This pie chart just shows an uh, example of uh, the kinds of costs that typical data center providers pay. Okay. And uh, what you will see is, the, so this has many different aspects of it. But the power, which is shown in green here, is a non-trivial aspect. Okay, so this, this part is actually the cost of the servers and the infrastructure itself, the blue part of the pie chart. Okay. And uh, the, the purple one is the hardware that you pay for the air conditioning and so on. This is the server. And this is what you will actually pay for the power itself. Okay, so about a third of your cost of running a data center is going into buying electricity from your electricity company. Okay, so that's 
something you want to optimize as much as possible by creating efficient versions of your data center. So if you look at the most uh, modern data centers that Facebook, Google, all of them run, they started doing two things. One is uh, they use their own gen power generation sources. Right? Using solar to generate electricity is an attractive option for many of these companies because you can generate your own power. Okay? So many data centers also have their own solar deployments where they, during the day at least, you can generate enough power to power your servers. Okay. The other thing that they have done is so that's basically reducing the reliance on the grid where you have to actually pay for power if you are generating your own. Okay. The other thing that they do is try to build more efficient cooling technologies. Okay. Facebook basically has many, if you just go and search Facebook uh, data center cooling, you will come up, uh, Google will show you uh, articles where they build data centers that are just using pumping open air from outside. Okay, so you essentially just draw outside air and then you exhaust the hot air that the server is generating. So you are not using air conditioning at all to the extent you can avoid it. Okay. Now this also causes problems because the outside air if it's not conditioned or uh, brings in humidity and other uh, things that will actually impact the efficiency of your equipment. Okay. There are scenarios where there was so much condensation in these data centers when the outside air is very humid that literally it starts dripping on servers because the pipes have condensation and then if you start having humidity on the servers, servers get wet and then you have problems with the reliability of the equipment. So you have to be careful when you use this kind of technologies but nevertheless uh, these companies are experimenting with these kinds of techniques all the time. It's not an OS issue okay? but nevertheless it's related to operating your servers and applications on them. Okay, so, so there's the last point is economies of scale. Okay, so uh, the larger your data center, the cheaper it is to build on a per unit basis okay, because you're going to get economies of scale. So the largest data centers today okay, can accommodate hundreds of thousands of servers. Okay, which is more than a million cores. Okay, the largest data centers are built by companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, because they have very large online services. Okay, they reach a global population, so you need very large uh, server capacity to service these uh, applications. Okay, so think of a system with a million cores, okay, 100,000 servers. How do you build it well so that you can reduce your operational cost. It's a very large challenge okay, because you will have all sorts of things happening inside that facility. Okay, servers may, application may crash, servers may fail. You need the ability to uh, manage these problems efficiently. You need the ability to reduce your costs and so on. Okay. And so when you have such large numbers of servers, managing them efficiently it also becomes an important challenge. It's cheaper to build, but then when you scale up, you need basically ability to manage them. Okay? And the way this is being done is using more automation. Okay, servers can reboot themselves when they crash. You don't actually need to go there to push a button. You can sit somewhere else and just say reboot and then your other infrastructure that power cycle serves. So there are all these automation tasks that are being used to reduce the cost of managing such large facilities. Okay. So, the, all because of all of these trends, okay, this has basically led to popularity of cloud computing, which is what we'll talk about for the next 20 or so minutes. Okay. So, I'll talk about what is cloud. Okay. I assume most of you have heard of this term. And then we'll say a little bit about uh, what kinds of cloud platforms there are and so on. So what is a cloud platform? A cloud platform is essentially a data center that somebody has built, has populated with servers, but rather than them running their own applications, they are renting you or they are giving you the ability to rent resources from these data centers. Okay? So fundamentally a cloud platform allows you to lease or rent CPU to computational storage or even software rather than buy. So you're going from uh, wanting to build your own data centers or running your own servers to run your applications to 
leasing equipment, leasing software. Okay, so you are going to essentially now not pay. So pay you are there as a pay as you go model. So the way cloud platforms work is you use whatever you need, and at the end of the month you get a bill. Say you use five servers uh, last month. You use 10 gigabytes of storage space. You use so much network. So your bill for this month is so many dollars, and you just pay that. Bill. So you can lease as much or as little capacity as you want. Okay, some of these cloud platforms bill you by the hour, as you will see. Okay, so you can essentially say, I want so much capacity for one hour, and then you say, now I'm done, and you hand that capacity back, and you only bid for an hour. So. So it has a, a pay-as-you-go model. It's basically a lease. You, know, you can you can get scale, high scalability because what clouds allow you to do is allocate and deallocate servers and storage on a fine time scale. And you can lease capacity, as I said, on granularity of hours or days. Okay, rather, if you buy a server, you're stuck with it for its entire lifetime, whether you can make good use of it or not. So for many companies, leasing is a better option than buying. And that's because of the unpredictable demands of applications, which I'll also talk about in just a moment. Okay. But depending on what you are trying to lease, whether it's machines, machines with uh, uh, some software installed on it, or machines with software and application installed on it, you have three different kinds of cloud models. Okay. They are called infrastructure clouds, platform clouds, and software clouds. The software clouds you probably know already. Any online service that you are actually using happens to be also a software cloud. Okay, Gmail is a good example. Okay, in case of Gmail, you don't you typically when you have personal Gmail, you don't pay for those resources. But you have business version of Google Mail, you actually pay on a monthly basis. You pay $25 per user every month. Okay? And what Google has done is they have basically built an entire suite of applications for you, which includes mail and Google Office, or office like applications, Google Drive, and so on. Okay, so you are renting software in this case. Okay, that's a software cloud. Okay, if you there are other commercial versions of this, like Salesforce is a good example. It's a business application to do customer management. Okay, you also rent by the month, and you pay for whatever you use. So if you are small, so if you if you are a company that has let's say ten employees, okay, rather than buying your own mail server, okay, you can just buy ten mailboxes from Google and just pay them a monthly fee and you are done. You don't have to manage the servers or have a system administrator to deploy software. None of that because somebody else is dealing with all of those issues and you are just using uh, paying for what you use. Okay, that's basically an attractiveness of uh, this this kind of model. Okay, so that's a software cloud. Okay, then one level below that is what is referred to as a platform cloud. A platform cloud essentially gives you a platform which basically is OS and some software that runs on it. And then you rent that platform and you run your own applications on it. Okay, in a software cloud, the applications come with whatever you are getting. Here you basically get a platform and you get to run your own applications on it. Okay, two examples of it are Google App Engine and Microsoft's Azure Cloud. So you can build, in App Engine, you can build a Python application, Python web application, and you just deploy it on Google's App Engine servers. Okay? It will take care of deciding how many servers to run your application on. If there are more requests coming in, it will scale up automatically. It will run your application on multiple servers. All of that is handled by the platform. Okay? Again, at the end of the month, you'll get a bill based on how much resources your application used in the previous month. If in one month it didn't use a whole lot, you get a lower bill. If in another month your application was popular, it used more resources, you pay more. Okay. So and Google obviously will run applications from, from lots of different customers. So they are taking their data center and multiplexing it or slicing it across these applications. That third parties customers are deployed. Okay. Same is true of Microsoft Azure Cloud, where you can take Visual C++ or .NET applications and just deploy it on their cloud. You don't need to buy any servers or anything like that. You just write the code and you deploy it there and they will run it for you. And you can then basically access your application as if it was running on your server. But it runs on their server and you are renting those resources from, in this case, Microsoft. 
that's a platform cloud and what is at the very bottom is what is referred to as an infrastructure cloud okay. so in an infrastructure cloud you basically rent machines you get bare bone servers you can run whatever you want on it okay. so you have to then deploy your own os deploy your own platform deploy your own applications okay. so if you want to do it all but just want to rent servers you go with an infrastructure cloud you say give me a server and you'll get a server then you can say let's install Linux or Windows or whatever you want on it. It will install it and then you do whatever you want with your server. So in this case the cloud provider is giving you bare bone machines. Okay. Except that that's a virtual machine not a physical machine. Okay. So when you say give me a server, they give you a virtual server not a physical server with some capacity allocated for it. Okay. So you have these three types of clouds and depending on what you are trying to achieve okay, in terms of uh, what you want to do and what you want a cloud provider to do, you will basically rent cloud resources at using one of these three platforms. Okay, so I'm going to give now a little more details of uh, two cloud platforms. One is an infrastructure cloud and one is a platform cloud. Okay, infrastructure cloud, we are going to take Amazon's cloud service. Okay, most of you know Amazon uh, as a retailer, okay, but they have this whole other business where they also run a cloud service for you. Okay, they are the largest cloud provider out there at the moment. Okay. They started off as an infrastructure cloud provider, but they also now have a large number of offerings where they provide you platform clouds, like they provide databases. They also have some applications that they allow you to rent. But I'm only going to talk about their infrastructure cloud okay, not their platforms and so on. Okay, so here are three types of servers you can rent from Amazon. Now there are about a dozen or so types of servers, but they started with three, okay, when they were sort of a small cloud provider. So you could basically, when you say give me a server, you have to specify a size. Okay? So your sizes that you can go are small, medium, large. Okay? And to define what a small server will give you. Okay, small server will give you one CP, one core, okay, 613 megabytes of RAM. I don't know why that odd number, but that's what you get and some amount of storage okay? and that costs you two cents an hour to rent okay? so for every hour you have that server allocated to you you will pay two cents it comes out to be a few tens of dollars every month for that server okay? that's a very cheap way of getting a server okay? if you are trying to try something out you don't have to go and spend a thousand dollars and buy a server you can rent one and pay maybe thirty dollars to Amazon every month and you still have a full fledged server. It's not on your premises, it's in their data center. But you can connect to it and do everything you could do in any regular server. Okay. Medium servers get you five cores, they give you get you more RAM, price goes up, okay, 17 cents an hour. There are large servers where you're getting even more cores. They actually now have a whole slew of large servers, extra large and extra extra large and all these kinds of server types yeah, where the cost goes up progressively. You also pay for storage and you pay for network bandwidth because every resource you consume is going to be paid for. So storage comes out to be 10 uh, cents per gigabyte per month. Okay, so if you want storage that is backed up, etc., you pay for that. You get this comes with some local disk, but if you shut down the server, data is wiped out. If you want the data to persist, you buy their persistent storage. Only 10 cents a gigabyte. Okay. Every month you'll pay that. And depends on how many gigabytes you used. Network bandwidth, same thing. You pay 10 cents per gigabyte of network traffic. If you're running a web server, they will meet up how many requests came in, how many bytes came in, how many bytes went out, and you'll get a bill at the end of the month. This is an infrastructure cloud. So you basically get a server and then you run whatever you want on your server. Okay, they don't restrict you. Other than running malicious things, you can pretty much run anything, and then they will just send you a bill at the end of every month. Okay. The nice thing about uh, Amazon's cloud is you can get servers in order of a few minutes. Okay. You say, Give me a server, okay. and five minutes later, they'll say, Here it is. That is the IP address you should use to connect your server. So you can provision servers in a matter of minutes, okay. not days. If you want to buy a server, really buy one uh, physical server, you have to order it, it will come and then you have to install it and so on. Okay, that takes several days. 
here you can basically get a server in an order of minutes. Now this is really important when you have applications that see dynamic workloads. Okay, there are many websites that are going to see the workloads that vary and news websites are notorious uh, whenever a big news story breaks everyone tries to go to their favorite news site okay, the workload is too high and the site goes down okay, because it cannot handle capacity. Okay. If you run your news site on the cloud and let's say you can never predict when some big story is going to break okay. but if some story breaks and the load on your server starts going up you can basically request additional resources from the cloud and give me another server give me another five servers and then the matter of minutes the servers are ready you need to have configured or you need to have some scripts that will allow you to deploy your applications quickly on that server and you can now have your website running on five servers rather than one and your capacity has gone up five fold in a matter of few minutes. So modern systems actually use these kinds of techniques they will scale up their capacity very quickly as workload starts rising for example. So in this case, you don't have to have a bank of five servers sitting there for waiting for the worst case, but most of the time only one of those servers is actually used. Okay, you're wasting all of those other resources. Here, you only pay for what you use. So if you use those five servers for one day and most of the time you only use one server, that's what you're going to pay. So it's more cost effective for many companies to use cloud resources. Okay, so next is the platform cloud. I talked about this already. So Google uh, runs one of the more popular platform cloud out there. It's called the App Engine. Okay. It essentially allows you to run, it has provides two platforms, Java and Python. Okay. You can run a Java applications, a Java server app on that platform, or you can write a Python web app okay, and then run it on that uh, platform. Okay. It's something like a Python Django app or uh, equivalent. Okay. So you write your code. But now rather than if you want, if it's a server application, rather than buying your server and configuring Java and all of this, you basically give that address and whatever. And then you can just have users of your application connect to it. And again, you're going to get a bill at the end of every month. What is nice here is you don't actually have to tell uh, your platform provider how large a server you need. Okay. At least in the infrastructure cloud case, you have to say, do I need a small, medium or large? Here you just give them some code and they will scale it up as your request to come into your application increases. Okay. So they will start spawning new worker threads. Each worker thread can now support some number of requests and as the workload subside, they reduce. So they are just going to meter how, much, how many requests are served and charge you accordingly. So you don't have to worry as a developer saying how large to make your system. Okay? They will scale it up and down as the workloads go up and down as well. Okay? Much more convenient, different way of uh, deploying applications. Okay? So that's a platform cloud. Okay? So everything I've talked about so far are fall under the category of what's called a public cloud. Okay? Public clouds are uh, cloud platforms where anybody who's willing to pay can basically sign up for an account and start using those resources. Yeah, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Azure, they all come under this category of a public cloud. If you actually have an Amazon account, you can essentially start leasing servers from them in order to buy, you know, in addition to buying things from Amazon. Okay, so it's available for anyone to use. Now companies are building their own internal clouds which are referred to as private clouds. Okay, so large companies have similar needs okay, rather than uh, so they may have multiple departments each department has their own applications so rather than uh, building a data center and statically allocating resources companies have started building their own internal clouds so if some department needs a new server you go and ask their internal cloud say allocate a new server it runs the same technology as what Amazon and uh, Google run except that they are running on your machines and rather than an IT administrator giving you a machine, you just make a request and the cloud software that's running on your server will say, here, take this machine, start using it. Okay. So companies, so now these clouds are not available to any outsider. It's only used by employees of that company, which is why they are called private clouds. Okay. Many large companies have deployed their own internal cloud. 
available to their own employees but not to anybody outside okay. and now there is a lot of software some of which is open source as well that's available to build a cloud okay, there's software like open stack and cloud stack that you can download if you have three machines you can make a cloud out of it by using the software and what the cloud software will do is it will allow you to allocate these resources to users on the fly as they need need those so this is referred to as a private cloud and then there is a hybrid model where you can take a private cloud and a public cloud and use them together and this is referred to as a hybrid cloud so if you have built a cloud with let's say 100 servers and someday you need 20 more servers than those 100 servers then you can actually borrow those 20 from amazon say and then make it part of your private cloud for a few days and then give them back so this is basically referred to as a private cloud or rather a hybrid cloud that takes a private and a public and puts it together okay so i only have two more slides and then i'm going to end uh, there is uh, some stuff i wanted to say about programming models okay. so i think last time or two lectures ago i talked about rmis okay, remote method invocation as a way to program uh, client server applications so, when you, so you can ask the question, if you have a cloud application, what kind of, how would you write your code? Okay, so you can do it the old way, which is just write it on whatever you want, rent a server and then install whatever software is necessary to run your application. Okay, or you can use some of the new cloud programming models that are coming about that make it easier to write applications okay, of our cloud platforms. And there are extensions that Google has proposed and Microsoft that allow you to write cloud applications. So in lab uh, two, you wrote MapReduce example uh, using Java. Okay, MapReduce happens to be actually a very popular programming model for the cloud to do large scale data processing. Okay. You can actually go to many companies and say, give me 10 MapReduce servers. I have 100 gigabytes of data to process for some task. And then you'll get those servers. You write your data processing application using MapReduce programming model. It's a very specific model. You have some idea of what it does based on your lab. You have a map phase and a reduce phase. Each of them do certain amount of processing and then you send data from the map to the reduce and so on. I won't go into the details here because that's not important. What is important to keep in mind is when you write very large distributed applications, okay, there are programming models that are available that make it much easier okay, just as RMI has made it easier to write a client server application without the underlying networking details. There are programming models that allow you to write large cloud applications without knowing about the underlying hardware details. Okay, okay so last slide here is on challenges with the cloud. Okay, so the biggest issue with many cloud platforms is privacy and security of your data. So companies don't want to rent servers from some third party and put their data on their servers because now the data is no longer in your control. It's in the control of the cloud provider. So your security now is as good as your cloud provider security. The cloud provider hasn't adopted good security practices and somebody hacks into their machine, it's your data that's getting compromised. Okay. This is the single biggest hurdle to using cloud services. So companies don't want their employees to use Dropbox as an example, if most of you may know what Dropbox is. But Dropbox puts your data on their servers, okay, or at least it goes through their server. It doesn't necessarily on their server, but in many cases it is. So if their servers get hacked and you put some sensitive data, your data is at risk. Okay. Now this, is, this may not be important if you are sharing photos or some personal data that is not sensitive. But for companies that have medical data or other forms of sensitive data, this is frowned upon. Okay, the university will not allow faculty to put student grades on cloud services okay, because that is sensitive data. Okay, they don't want any compromise of student records, for example. So privacy and security is the biggest problem because now security is not under your control. You basically rented resources. So their security is basically now as, your security is as good as their security. 
biggest issue. Two other issues which are equally important, but from the from the cloud provider's perspective, is extreme scalability and uh, programming models. So basically, how do you manage a million server cloud? Yeah, Amazon's cloud probably has more than a million servers. So how do you decide when some customer comes and says, "Give me a medium server"? Which server? Which virtual server to give them from their million servers? What do you need to do to track what's happening on each server? Where are there sufficient resources? Where do you put a customer? How do you track how much bytes they are consuming? How to build them? So it's a complicated task to build such large distributed systems. A yeah, cloud platform is a very large distributed system that's providing services to third parties. Okay. And then the programming model I talked about already. Okay, one last thing I'll mention here. This will be on the web page soon is based on what I just described, the last homework is to write a term paper. Okay. Term paper is going to be on cloud computing and I would like you to do some additional research. There are plenty of resources available on the web and write a few pages of term paper saying what is a cloud, go and explain what an infrastructure platform software cloud is, give some examples, go and do, go into these two that I just discussed here which is the EC2 cloud, Amazon's cloud and Google's cloud and uh, understand what it does and write a little, uh, uh, like write some details about it and maybe some examples of when to use it. So I'll mention what exactly we are expecting in the, on the web page after I'm done with the class. But you are expected to not just ignore what I said here, but I do want you to go and write a term paper. A term paper is, as I said, due at the end of this week. But for those of you who need a little more time, you can submit it next week without any late penalties. Okay, so uh, that's next week is finals week, so I technically cannot make it due next week. So it's officially due on Friday. But if you turn it in sometime next week, there won't be any late penalties. Yes, question. So I mean, do we need like something like a thesis or just kind of like an overall? Just two three pages. Right. I'm not expecting like a 50 page report. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just something that you explains what you understood about this topic. Don't just do blind cut and paste. Okay, I can produce that cut and paste in five minutes by going to three websites. Try to understand it and explain in your own words what you learned about this topic. Okay, so that's all we are expecting. <laughs>